So we're going to look at uh, post-colonialism, but I'm going to come at it through the work of uh, Edward Said's work, Orientalism, because Orientalism, a book that he writes in 1978, becomes the sort of, um, is, is the, first of all, it's the book that makes Said famous, but secondly, it, it spawns what's called post-colonial studies. It's a so the first foray into what then gets uh, taken to be a study of the non-Western world or the perspectives of non-Western peoples uh, that just gets presented in different ways. And Orientalism is the first foray into that, which is just simply, if you want to look on this little map here, the map of Rome, 300 AD, there's the Orient and then there's the Occident. Uh, these terms are not much used in English. They are still used in French. Um, but in, in, Engl in English, we talk about the Orient. And when we talk about the Orient, we tend to be talking about Orientals. And we, they were talking about people from the Far East. Um, <coughs> East Asian. Lots of confusion of terminology uh, and so forth. But historically, the Orient will refer to the Eastern uh, Christian uh, Empire, uh, which will become under the uh, Constantinople. Where will Constantinople be? Here, where right there, um, the seat of the of Eastern Christendom when it when there's a divergence between East and West. But the but the Orient and the Occident. Uh, is the division between East and West that um, includes uh, Christianity uh, in its, its Eastern Orthodox iteration. <coughs> but in general, uh, the Orient as in, is considered to be non-West and not associated with Christianity, which is partly why Edward Said is interest, interesting because Edward Said is a, an Episcopalian born in uh, uh, West Jerusalem. So very interesting, in 1935, before the uh, creation of the modern nation state of Israel, he's born in West Jerusalem in an area that uh, is occupied by the British at that point, uh, in what the area that we now call Palestine. And so he has a very uh, odd uh, biography, in a sense, does Edward Said. And I'm going to talk a little bit about his biography and then talk about the intellectual influences on his work, Orientalism, and this idea of the Orient and the Occident, or East and West, and then, talk, and then try and, like a, a ripple on the, a pond when you throw a stone into it, and how it sort of spills out, because this discussion of Orientalism spills over then to the discussion of Africa and of India, so-called subaltern studies, uh, and, and then into other countries as well. But it's, it's basic, basically a consequence of the fact, I, th I think, of the influence of the Western world on the non-Western world or the developed world on the non-developed world or whatever over the course of the 19th and the 20th centuries. And the influence of European countries on Africa and South America and Asia, etc., and then the look at culture from the vantage point of those who have been uh, colonized. So try and look at it from a different perspective, and the perspective is often presented in just this terms of uh, the other phrase that they often use: the other. To be an other is simply to be not part of the dominant narrative of Western civilization. Um, or if you're included in it through colonization, nonetheless, the specific features of your own culture background are not uh, recognized adequately within the dominant narrative of, of, of the West. And so it, it arises, as I say, there's a little bit of uh, historical features to it, although the history of um, Orient and Occident uh, is a pre-Christian narrative because it's, it basically 
follows the contours of uh, the Roman Empire, as you can see here. 300 is before Christianity is officially the uh, religion of, of the Roman Empire and before the East and Eastern Christendom divides from the West, before Byzantium as a uh, civilization exists, etc. But it really does take uh, on new legs in the scramble for Africa in the 18th century. Let me put that up here as well. because So this is 300 AD, scramble for Africa. Have you heard of the scramble for Africa? Well, I'll put it up here and look. we'll look at the map here. This is, we'll look at this because it'll give us a nice little map. I'm sure they will give us helpful maps, does it? Yes, this is it. So this is an artistic representation of the different uh, ethnic groups uh, and, and their influence in Africa up till 1500. And you can see that there are certain uh, tribal influences and so forth. I suspect in other areas they're just less um, significant. It's not that there are no people there, but it's less significant. Come the 1914, you can see that the Europeans have in entirely colonized Africa. This will be French Africa, the pink will be British, the blue will be German, the uh, Dark yellow here, here will be Belgian, little Italian up in Libya and over here in Ethiopia, Eritrea, uh, etc. These are not helpful. Okay. I wanted maps. This is the no, it's not it. I've seen it in a different in a different class. I had a different map for it. Anyway. Uh, the scramble for Africa takes place in the late 19th century and is, is the, what we most strongly associate with colonialism. There are coloni colonies of Europe in uh, North America and in South America before this. So Christopher Columbus and that narrative, 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue, etc., takes um, uh, on ships, goes across the Atlantic, and uh, to Cara, Terra Incognita and starts exploring the world, bringing back exotic spices, speaks of peoples unknown, lots of questions in Europe about who these people are, since the account of the nations of the earth comes from scripture. Who are these people? Are they from uh, Ham, Shem, or Japheth, the three sons of Noah after the flood? How did they get there? Where did they come from? Who are these people? Uh, at first, we called the people in North America Indians because the assumption of, the, uh, of Columbus, etc., is that they've gone, uh, they've gone west and eventually they've hit India because they know that India exists, so they've just hit the east coast of India. So they're called Indians. Now, this, this misapprehension gets quickly overturned, but the name sticks. We call natives of this country Indians because of that. Um, but, but curious, how did they get there? Where did they come from, etc.? Lots of discussion on that front. How do we treat them? What status do they have? Are they um, the lost tribes of Israel? I mean, who knows what? All sorts of theories are, are surrounding that. And, um, but that's not sp uh, specifically the challenge of colonialism that arises as Said identifies it, the one that Said identifies is that of Orientalism, which is the problem of the Orient, which by this point is the Muslim-speaking world, because Islam spreads out from uh, Saudi Arabia and slowly starts to uh, conquer the entirety of the Roman Empire, and, and which were Christian nations and so forth. And that's the area that is pushed into during the scramble for Africa in the 18th century. Let me get this picture here. These countries up here, 
and that will include around here, are also under, under European influence, or in fact, colonies. But then they clash with civilizations that are ancient Christian civilizations, often ancient Christian religions, Orthodox and Coptic and otherwise, like in Egypt, but also a significant population of Muslims and speaking a variety of languages, in some cases Arabic, but in uh, Egypt, not Arabic. Egypt, Egyptians are not Arabs. We often uh, associate, associate Islam with Arabs, etc., and so there's a lack of differentiation there and a lack of an awareness of the complexity of the various peoples that live in what we would call the Orient. And Said is one of the illustrations of that because, as I say, he's, a, he's an Episcopalian growing up in West Jerusalem. Um, I think he, it, I, I read an account, his midwife chanted to him in Arabic and Hebrew in 1935 when he was born there. So very complex, sophisticated. This is part of what uh, Said's uh, work, Orientalism, is go going to try and discuss, which is the complexity of the portrait of the other. The other is not just uncivilized. It's not just um, undifferentiated otherness. There's, there is interaction with, let's say, the Orient, for example. Go back to this picture. I'll get rid of this so I stop going to this and I won't go to that. This area of the world has been uh, under the influence of the Greeks the Romans, the Christians, um, and all the different ethnicities that are already under that, as well as then Islam and, uh, and the various differences within Islam as well and the different uh, reigns of different uh, empires, etc. And all of that, the vestiges of that are left around the entire Mediterranean. So the entire Mediterranean has a very complex, rich, deep, and uh, confusing history of languages, cultures, religions, influences, etc. But is in general, this is the seat of the great books of the Western tradition. Greece, Rome, Europe, etc. Now, Europe in general starts to becoming starts to come from the perspective of Western Christendom. Eastern Christendom is largely ignored in the great books tradition which is taught in Europe and in North America and what I was taught and which I, what I value and what Said valued and was taught, by the way, as well in the schools that he went to, first in uh, Cairo, which he fled to in, I think, in 1946 or something like that, um, uh, fled there and was schooled again in a private school, a, a private British school before I think he was expelled because of bad behavior and his father sent him to, a, to a, 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 an American institution in the eastern United States. But he was steeped in the great books tradition, a great books tradition that sort of ignored some of the complexities of identity that arise in areas like this. And he was often taken to be a Muslim so in 1989, he was put on the p cover of Commentary magazine as the professor of terror, even though he was, as I say, from background, a, a Palestinian from the Episcopalian camp, not Arab at all, but you know, spoke some Arab and, and corresponded with Yasser Arafat, the head of the PLO at the time, with whom he had a very complex relationship, and they did not exactly see eye to eye, and he was a critic of Arafat as well. But his, but uh, so Said, in his person, I think is part of the narrative that I want to present of Orientalism, and with that post-colonialism, because the portrait that Said presents is of the complexity of what is normally seen as simply non-Western. So there's Western, and then there's non-Western, and he calls the non-Western just simply the other. And, and in doing that, uses the language to some degree of structuralism that we've already seen of the binary differentiation. So you're either Western or you're Eastern, or you're Western or you're Oriental in this case. And he's, an, he's considered an Oriental from the perspective of the, uh, 
uh, old language. We, we wouldn't say Oriental in English, but he calls the book Orientalism, referring to this area of the world. As I say, in, in North American lingo, we would not call that the Orient at all. We just call it, I don't even know what we would call it now, the Middle East, the ancient Near East. You, at the University of Toronto, it's called ancient Near Eastern studies which will relate to this whole region over here. And again, will sort of to some degree uh, reduce all of the differences between it to an ancient Near Eastern homogenous culture, although they're also very different from one another and with different languages and histories and religions, etc. Anyway, but, but if you're going to study something in a uh, coherent fashion, you do have to, to some degree, generalize. You can get down in the specifics and then point out how the generalizations don't apply and are, are contradicted, but they, to some degree at least, to, to have a perspective that is general enough to be considered academic and intellectual, you do have to generalize and make certain statements of common identity, etc. cetera. Uh, all Saeed does, to my mind, is to point out the complexity of the, the identity of the Orient which is not being understood by Americans and perhaps not really even being understood by the Europeans, which he personally knows from the inside as somebody who grew up uh, in that uh, context. Uh, but when he does this, he speaks within the context of a narrative of by this point, so he's writing largely in the 70s and 80s and so forth, of a left-leaning left academic culture that is, broadly speaking, receptive of cultural Marxist narratives. And I've already talked about cultural Marxism uh, in connection with the Frankfurt School. How they originated in in, uh, in and around Frankfurt uh, from, with some differences between them, but largely sympathetic towards the uh, communist narrative, but operating within, uh, as I say, the Western world. Frankfurt is in West Germany, what became West Germany when the two were divided, uh, but which fled Germany at the time the Nazis came to power because most of the uh, Frankfurt School were, were Jewish, and so they fled for their lives, largely decamped to universities like Columbia where Edward Said wrote Orientalism. So influences of a school of thought that is in general um, promoting a view of history in which we have the, uh, the rulers and the oppressed, the, the factory owners and the laborers the Marxist narrative of power and money and influence. That's the grid through which the Marxist looks at the world and largely in relation to material wealth. So there's the haves and there's the have-nots. And Said's Orientalism, or in its later iteration, post-colonialism, is the exact same narrative of the haves, the West, and the have-nots, the East. And the um, superficiality of the distinctions, but also the, uh, the oppression that results from that privileging of the West over and against the East or the Orient. Uh, so he very quickly slots into that narrative, although to some degree, I have to say, I don't think he is uh, interested in the cultural war per se. He is more interested in the complexity of the picture. And, and the perspectives that reside within it. So he's not really a, I'm not sure that he is a, well, he, he is not an activist in the academy in the same way his successors become. Although he, in his own person, seems to represent that. And he's a very interesting figure, a bit of a dandy. Um, he's he, uh, very well dressed, concert pianist, um, you know, drove around the eastern seaboard in a, in a 
convertible with all sorts of pretty w women on his arm. Um, so he, had a, he cut a good figure. He had a certain dash about him. Uh, and, and his background makes him, sell, makes him very interesting as well. But that is um, a, just a rough portrait of, of Said. Uh, trained at Princeton University in the end and Harvard in a, uh, as a literary scholar in the European American humanist tradition. So he reads the texts that we read, but he is a critique of those texts and their portrait largely of the areas that reside outside of that. And you can see those from within the texts even. <clears throat> so in Mary F Shelley's Frankenstein, for example, there's a reference to um, an Egyptian woman whose name is Safi or Safi, which is probably the a derivation on Sophia. She represents oriental wisdom. She's dark, darker skin. She's mysterious. She's on the outskirts of Western civilization. She speaks with a sort of a wisdom coming from the Orient that the West doesn't understand in its attempt to colonize the world. Because remember, in the context of Frankenstein, uh, it's about harnessing the power of nature and gaining power over it in order to do experiments on nature as if nature was just this blanc mange, um, in undifferentiated stuff, which we could just gain power over and to damn the hell with the consequences effectively. And it, um, that's in Victor Frankenstein's lab. On the other hand, there's another explorer uh, by the name of Walton going to trying to find the north, Northwest Passage. We find him up in the Arctic, trapped in the ice fields. And it's, it's Western exploration pushing the boundaries of Western civilization, terra incognita, doing it without wisdom. And Safi represents a sort of a wisdom which is being ignored in the context of that. And that's in general the postulate within the Western Academy towards the Eastern world is that there's a, a wisdom that resides in the West, in the Orient, that the Western world has ignored to its own uh, harm, but also to the harm of those around them. It presents those that are non-Western as savages, effectively. And within the Western tradition, at least in the 18th century, 19th century, there's a strong um, desire to rehabilitate the uh, integrity, the wisdom, um, and to some degree, the civilization of the East. You'll find that as far back as, uh, as Goethe as well. There's a work called the Ost. Uh, I'm gonna, I Divan, which is a reference to uh, uh, to Persia, in the writer Goethe, the German great German uh, classicist writer, uh, and a desire. In fact, he learns Persian, and corresponds with a man, by a great Persian poet by the name of Hafiz at the time. Correspondence between the two. So, within the context of Germany and an attempt to gain knowledge of cultures outside of the Western uh, cultural influence and belief that there's some wisdom in, in those cultures. You'll see the same thing in the 19th century, a push to learn uh, Sanskrit and so forth by Western academics. And a portrait of the East that is far more complementary from those influenced by Romanticism. So Sir Walter Scott will portray the um, Saladin, the uh, great Muslim military leader of the Ottoman, is it the Ottomans at the time? I think it is, um, as a more civilized man than the Crusaders, it's portrayed in contemporary film as well. So there's a, an attempt from the middle of the Enlightenment onward to see the East not as other, but rather as a source of wisdom that the West in its commitment to Western rationalism and progress and enlightenment ha is ignoring. That's already embedded in the, in, in the literature, I said, from the 18th century onwards. Uh, but, but by this point, 
post scramble for Africa, it, it intensifies. And the narrative of the um, colonized gains uh, a sort of uh, social political credence uh, seen through a Marxist lens of oppression and oppressor and so forth. Um, and so that's very much a part of the whole discussion of, of post-colonial literature. So as I say, it will move from Said's Orientalism into subaltern studies in India, et cetera, et cetera. Now, do you have any, I've just cast the general contours of this, any comments or questions about this at this stage? things down. So Saeed's own background, born in 1935, has to flee West Jerusalem for Cairo first, and then eventually moves over to the United States to an area which is under influence of and goes to universities that are very much influenced by cultural Marxist narratives and comes in contact with the sort of French uh, intellectual tradition that I've mentioned already a few times. So he's very much influenced by Michel Foucault, who I'll talk about next time, uh, but also by Jacques Derrida and uh, also by uh, a British uh, writer by the name of Raymond Williams, who is a, I don't want to call him a cultural Marxist, He's a, he's a literary critic who has leftward leanings. I don't think he's cultural Marxist per se, but, but, uh, but that sort of uh, influence at any rate, who wants to look at uh, around the boundaries of the ac academia and wants to include things that have been ignored within the academic gaze. Because the academic gaze, as the 20th century uh, develops, becomes more and more and more specialized. It doesn't, it doesn't even look at the boundaries of, or question the categories other than it, when it tries to subvert them. Um, it, it just simply takes what is given as the, this is what academic study does, and then it looks at them in myopic ways, narratives. These writers concerned are interested in the big picture. <coughs> the structuralists, the post-structuralists, they're interested in, in talking about the the canvas. What are we talking about here? So their interest is, to some degree, metacritical, theoretical. That's why it's called lit theory. They want to discuss that in a way that almost nobody does in the Western world. They are simply wa working within the contours of the Western tradition as it's been inherited, first from Christians, then by the Enlightenment, and and, and then just passing it on, and then doing it for largely pragmatic reasons, but not really asking the question of what is a human being? They just assume, and largely don't even pass on the tradition of what a human being is. They've not even passed on a theological understanding of human nature. Um, <coughs> and in some ways, they've actually destroyed the Western tradition of what uh, human nature is because the Enlightenment already reduces human nature to being a rational animal or a political animal. That's what it says in Diderot's encyclopedia, which sounds like he's copying Aristotle and to some degree he is, but I think he's also moving away from it by calling it, um, man a rational animal with the emphasis on animal. Note that the word person is not there anymore. Boethius' definition of human nature is an individual substance of a rational nature, which sounds even more abstract, and that's because it is. It's philosophical language. Uh, but it's not an animal. He doesn't associate human beings with animals as opposed to non-animals. He's talking about the particular qualities of a human being uh, as opposed to an angel, for instance. Or, or, or even an animal, but he doesn't have any commonality between human beings and animals because animals uh, don't have a rational nature. It's the rational nature that is of particular interest there. Anyway, um, did, did you have a question? Or? I actually just wanted to, the Frankfurt School, you said? Yes. When they fled after World War II, 
Yes. He went to Columbia. Before World War II. Oh, before, sorry. Because Hitler comes to power in 1935, there's a big cultural pressure yeah. um, and Jewish life becomes almost impossible. You're threatened with uh, extraordinary consequences which only get worse. Yeah. And many just leave. Okay, and they went to... Columbia. They disperse. So, uh, Columbia becomes an important center. Uh, and um, so several go to Europe, or, um, Paris, but many go to the United States. And uh, in the lecture, I talked a little bit about that. Um, but Columbia becomes a center of, of the Frankfurt School, so it decamps, as it were. And you mean, when you mean Columbia, you mean like the United States? Columbia is in New York City. Okay, okay. Columbia University. Okay, okay, that's what I was at first thought. But then no, I'm not talking about the United States as Columbia. Okay, yeah. I was like, uh, I don't know. Or the country of Columbia, nor yeah. am I speaking of that. I'm I talking about Columbia saying. University. Well, it's in New York City, so, and, and in general, uh, the eastern seaboard, the universities there are more uh, oriented towards Europe. The West Coast is also progressive, but they're oriented towards uh, East Asia. And you say, well, what's the commonality there? And the commonality is that uh, in both cases, they're moving away this is just my take on it. They're moving away because Europe is moving away from a Christian understanding towards the Enlightenment in the East. In the West, they're moving, as in the West Coast, a, a sort of a techno-humanism of the um, uh, sort that we're going to talk about at the end of the course, um, uh, transhumanist narrative. In both cases, there's an attack on human nature, but it, it comes from a, a different perspective. But there are, there's a common ground there in, in the sense that both of them are opposed to the narrative of differentiation. So this is, this is the main thrust of Orientalism, is the division between Orient and Occident, he says, the boundaries ought not to be as clearly demarcated as, as they are. So the idea of this is the us and this is the other. We're the, we're the, um, you know, the natives and these are the foreigners or the aliens. Is, is he of the opinion then that it's one collective human story and like theory, like we're all part of the same, more or less, yeah, you could look at it under like my, like more closely differentiated, oh, there's some people that have this more tradition, that more tradition, uh, he, he wants to show complexity. He's not necessarily moving in the direction of universality, as in unification per se. He wants to just show that they're the portrait of the other, which is in general, the, they're non-civilized and you know we're the civilized and the East is non-civilized or the Orient is not civilized, uh, he says is obviously a misrepresentation. <laughs> but even associating the, um, the Orient, which is an ancient civilization much older than Europe, with uh, cultures where they don't even have the rudiments of civilization, uh, comparatively speaking, is a, just an association of things that are totally different. So if you want to go into people that live in the bush or in the jungle, and associate them with the Orient, it seems a rather crude uh, association. All they have in common is that they're not Western. But that doesn't mean that uh, they're all um, other. So he's showing the complexity of the other. That's what Orientalism does. But he also shows, to some degree, the degree of uh, hierarchy and privilege that resides within the space of the West as opposed to the East. And later writers, particularly the post-colonialists, will strongly emphasize this and push it in a cultural Marxist direction, saying that we ought to um, rehabilitate, if not promote, perspectives that are, are not just non-Western, but even anti-Western. 
with a sort of a humanist imperative of that these are people are human beings, we ought to hear their stories, we ought to read their stories, we ought to understand their perspective. Their perspective will be not necessarily rationalist and it will not be dominated by whites and it won't necessarily be male, et cetera. So we'll, we'll want to hear the div a diverse range of voices and ethnicities, et cetera, which is today represented if you go to English textbooks in the big editions, the anthologies, they tend to be no, no longer Western cultural texts, but they are texts written by a variety of different languages, ethnicities, uh, sexes, etc. So we want more female authors, we want more non-Western authors, we want more uh, non-Christian authors, etc. for the sake of representing the otherness. That was already off topic. I know, that's fair. <laughs> is, it, is it, that's not in itself bad though, right? We, it, but it's for the, like, listening to it, the I'm, 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 not, I'm not judging on its goodness or badness. I'm just trying to trace its, uh, the, the sort of internal impulse that drives it. Yeah, so it's like, for, what, what, for the sake of what? Implementing these things in the end. And at that point it becomes complicated. Because as I say, Saeed himself is a complicated man, and although he's called a terrorist uh, in the United States in 1989, because it's, you know, he's the professor of terror because he connected with the PLO and Yasser Arafat and so forth, <coughs> even though he's not a Muslim and he, <laughs> and uh, he is not, he doesn't promote that per se, but he promotes complexity in the whole picture. Um, I'm trying to show the, the, the initial spirit of it, and then I'm going to say once Orientalism establishes itself as the Orient versus the Occident, the East versus the West, with that already the binary differentiation within the, uh, the literary theory of uh, the academy in the 20th century, it's going to start moving in different directions away from Said's complexity portrait to actually in a non-complex it's just the oppressors versus the victims mentality. You're the, you're the colonialists, you're the colonizers, you're the oppressors. The Palestinians are the, um, you know, uh, the, the, the Israelis are, are genocidal. They're committing genocide in the Palestinian people, that sort of stuff, which you read popularly right now, right? It's part of the chance because of what's going on in Israel as we speak. Uh, talk about uh, Israel as a genocidal state, even from the outset, which is a very, by, by any standard, or I shouldn't say any standard because some people don't agree, but by most people's standard is a, a horrific overgeneralization. And probably, um, and here I will speak for myself, an offensive generalization because it seems to diminish what a real genocide looks like, which is an extermination an attempt to annihilate a whole group of people. That's what a genocide is. And a, and a plan and an agenda to do exactly, that's what a genocide is. But this, within the academy, the, what begins as complexity in Said's work uh, quickly falls into the, the, the us and other narrative, which is the oppressor and oppressed narrative. And, and there's a, a social justice that then gets attached to this which is strongly represented in post-colonial studies. And then will be presented in, in, uh, in Canada in indigenous literatures and so forth, which again, roughly falls into that same narrative. And largely those that advocate the perspective of the other are going to talk about the wisdom within that tradition and the perspective having a certain integrity and wisdom, which we don't understand, don't value, should listen to, etc and then gets taught in schools accordingly. And even will include pedagogies. So we ought not to do what I'm doing here as a white male lecturing to you and declaiming and telling you things. I ought to be listening to the various perspectives around the room and everyone will share and none of the perspectives will be dominant because we want to recognize the integrity of the people speaking and the otherness perspective, uh, perspectives around the room and, and to hear that and listen as opposed to telling, we're hearing. So it, it, it bleeds over into pedagogy as well. And, and you can't adjudicate between the two because, because reasoning is a Western thing 
and if somebody is speaking irrationally or incomprehensibly, it's still valuable because we don't want to say there's a right and a wrong, because that too is a binary opposition which we ought not to impose in the situation. And at this point, the whole thing unravels and becomes chaos. And post-colonialism tends towards chaos. And, or or now, it is, now it is chaotic. It promotes chaos. Because there isn't even within post-colonial studies a post-colonial perspective because every colony from the Orient to, to an Afri African studies, to Hispanic studies, to indigenous studies, to uh, subaltern studies from the country of India from, to, to the uh, actual Asian studies, uh, is going to be different because they have a different background, etc. There's nothing that unites them other than their uh, their shared um, difference from the West. So we're the other that unites them, and they dislike the other, I guess. And it tends to be white Western others that are in these positions. Although increasingly they are no longer white or Western, but they speak from a Western context against Western culture. So you'll get women. You'll get queers, we'll get different ethnicities, et cetera, representing a, a, an anti-Western narrative on behalf of the marginalized communities around the world, which actually are, <laughs> tend to object to the perspective being presented on their behalf, particularly when it is, uh, goes against traditional values of those same cultures. So if it's anti-family or if it's you know, promoting a queer perspective or a gendered perspective, the, those same countries that are allegedly marginalized um, object most strongly to that being imposed upon them, but that comes from the post-colonial camp and bleeds over into practical ways into things like, um, you know, the uh, charitable donations and so forth and how funding gets applied through UN agencies. And so the UN tends to promote post-colonialism very strongly, if that makes any sense. Yes? Um, I, uh, I want to ask a question about, um, uh, because when I, when I think of Orientalism, I tend to, because my mind goes to uh, a lot of translation work. Um, mm -hmm. For example, like something I personally become very interested just to look at my own heritage would be some of the work by Alfred uh, E. Wallace on uh, Egyptian studies. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm curious because a lot of what I, what I read that ends up becoming classified under Orientalism is simply translation work that, that actually doesn't have much of a uh, narrative say, per se. Um, I'm, wa I'm interested in what aspect of oriental studies enters into discussions of narrative, whether it's like um, certain commentary or like how does, how does that come into play? <coughs> so it begins from Said because Said is, uh, he's trained in the Western humanities tradition of reading and reading the texts even of the Western humanities tradition, things like everything from from Homer and the Bible up to, I don't know, Jane Austen and onwards, I, like stuff that we would read here. That's, it, that's what he reads and then he sees and he's attentive and interested in the way that, let's say, the Orient, how, how, how do, in Jane Austen's novel, how is the, and the British Navy is uh, very much promoted in Austen's novels. The British Navy is often uh, heroic. These are young men who are, you know, going abroad and fighting for ki queen and country and doing noble things and very dashing. And there's a sort of a, the uh, modern uh, ver version of a of a knight in front of you in the British officer, which gets passed into the American um, context as well. Sort of a promotion of the of the of the the armed services and the nobility of the profession and how they have to engage with that. Um, he o she often, he often looks at uh, work like uh, Austin's Mansfield's Mansfield Park and how the upper and middle classes 
engage with their work in India, for example, or in Egypt, where the, at this point the, the British Navy is taking, uh, the, uh, taking Britain overseas with them and coming back with experiences, etc. He's interested in looking at that, but he's not act it's not interested, or he's not interested in translation, per se, although he does get involved with that to some degree. Um, but I think it spills over into that area, and that, I think that's always, I'm fascinated by translation. I think translation is really interesting. Uh, because there is never, every language is actually different. And, and the words, although when you're learning a new language, you'll say, well, this word in uh, French means that, like a cat is a shot, okay. In German's a hund, and in other languages, so you can find the word. But even within those languages, the associations with those, uh, a shot's not a hund, it's a katze, never mind. Um, the, um, even within those languages, there are different connotations connected to those individual words even. So in certain cultures, let's say a dog, a dog is just an animal. It's man's best friend, it's a, you know, it, in, in English speaking countries, it's only positive. In German, if you call somebody a dog, a person, it's hugely offensive. And Arabic, Arabic as well, I know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's hugely offensive. If you say it in English, that's like, you, you dog. No, no offense taken at all. It sounds a little odd. But it's just the same word. But the, but the associations, the connections with other things come into play. A translator has to account for those when making the translations. So a dog's a dog, but I, how do I, if I'm translating from an Arabic text where somebody's calling somebody a dog and means something very derogatory and offensive, how do I capture that in the English translation? Well, I can't use the word dog, right? So those sorts of things, and you can imagine both ways how they go then. And then it becomes even more challenging when you're de dealing not with just specific instances that seem rather inoffensive, but have genuine philosophic and theological implication, like a person. Very important. Um, in, in, in Canada, Natives did not have person status up until 1935. They didn't have the status of persons. Do you, most people don't even know that. Under the law, they were not treated as persons. because per, And person is a legacy, as, as I've said in other classes, of a theological tradition that gives you human rights, etc. By calling the natives of this country, or not calling them persons, they were to some degree depriving them of a legitimacy before the law, which non-natives had and so again but how do I convey that in certain ways but again there's a, a history becomes a factor culture becomes a factor uh, the use of terms becomes a factor all of those things could be considered under the guise of orientalism I would just say and that's just then good translation theory um, but that's part of what becomes, for me, very interesting and legitimate, but also uh, the complexity of being a translator. Even more so with a cultural text. Because now, in addition to that, you want to, you want to have something of the spirit of the author, the beauty of the original, the cadences, the, the, the richness of the text. How do I capture that in another language? Basically impossible. So uh, to translate a great author, a great poet into another language, you have to be one in that language. Although you actually have to be it in both because you have to have been able to read the sophistication that's intended here and all the nuance and the subtlety here and then to try and replicate it in another language, extraordinarily difficult to do. You, it, you don't, it's not just fluency, you have to be fluent obviously, but it's beyond that, it's cultural fluency in both cultures. That is uh, almost by definition going to preclude most people because even if you learn the language you're not going to know all the deep associations uh, that come with that. But that's part of the Eastern or the, or the, the, uh, the West and the Oriental Orientalism is he's talking about this and in, insofar as he does and is in the humanist tradition 
I like Said and approve of what he's saying. I think there's richness there, and he's observing the complexity, and I don't think there's, I think that's not a bad thing. From the perspective of the university where he's teaching, how do we hold on to his attention to the margins and the complexity on the margins without getting caught up in the narrative of oppressor and oppressed, which quite frankly does a disservice to both sides? Because there's complexity within the West as well. There's complexity. I mean, I teach Western literature and I try and show how even over the course of time, texts reading other texts misrepresent the text or take them in a different direction. So for good, for ill, whatever, they change what is being met. And that's why you know, when we study the epic, we, s we talk about the evolution of the epic, the transformation of the epic and what constitutes a hero and who's included in the epic gaze. Does it include just a specific culture? Is it just the Greeks that we're interested in, the Roman Empire, all civilization, all of human history? What's being discussed here? No notions of the gods. All, those are all changing over the course of time, uh, which you only get when you look at the differences between the texts. But again, if you just say West, good, non-West, other, bad, and then reverse the verdict on it, non-West, good, West, bad, which is what we have in the academy now, this is just ridiculous and goes contrary to Said's Orientalism, as far as I can see. But that's what we have in the academy right now. And I'm doing this little lecture on post-colonialism largely to show how um, I have some sympathies and then also just to show where then it goes after that. And it's an extraordinary thing because once the Cold War ends, which is in 1989, roughly, Berlin Wall comes down. Um, and the East and the West, they're not between the Occident and the Orient, but between co the communist world and the so-called free world, that boundary collapses, the wall collapses, the, the um, constellations, the powers, the map gets broken down, the, un the USSR breaks down into the Ru Russia and Ukraine and the various republics and starts fragmenting. And, uh, and NATO, though it exists, doesn't have an, op uh, an opponent per se, as it once did. What happens to the boundaries everywhere? Politically, they're changing. Culturally, they're changing because we have the push for um, I talked about the three, four waves of feminism. The third wave emerges in and around the, the time of the collapse of the Cold War. And also the queer theory of Foucault, etc., starts to emerge most strongly, although he's writing in the 80s. He's still a very peripheral figure. But in the intervening period, I'll talk about this next time, over the 30 years from the, from the 80s onward, he's the most cited scholar in the, uh, in in uh, Western academic circles, Michel Foucault, queer theorist. And the boundaries then between the West and the East are, become the boundaries between the straight and the queer. And, and, and the Christian versus the non-Christian, which can even include the Christian because much of this area are full of Christians as well. And they're, and they're oppressed Christians, they're the marginal Christians within that country and they they're get thrown under the rubric of the other. And Said is saying, well, it's not quite so simple as all that. Uh, but, but there's an attempt now within the Western Academy to go against its own self uh, as an oppressor. And uh, it's irreducibly uh, complex, I think. But now the complexity has been resolved and um, it's, it's just, it's the opposite of complexity. It's that whatever is Western Whatever is rational, whatever is white, whatever is heterosexual is bad. And that's the cultural Marxist flip. Whatever is wealthy is bad. Whatever is poor is good. Um, and ironically, happens in the English speaking world. And is most strongly promoted in the English speaking world in the Eurocentric. Eastern Seaboard University of the United States. And I'll include Canada in that. Uh, and on the West Coast, the same narrative against the West, but from the vantage point of um, 
a sort of it's a sort of a frontier humanism. It's a good way of describing the transhumanism. Let's get move away from any differentiated human history and let's just scrap everything and start all over again. Because that's the Western mentality. If you go out west, there are, you will struggle to find a building that's 100 years old or, or a culture that has much her heritage at all. You'll find people from all over the world who are tech people, but a lot of hippies on the west coast. And uh, it's a culture that is, it's not, I, I could say it's superficial and it, maybe it is, but it's more, it's committed to what's coming next rather than what was before. It's committed to, to the future rather than the past. And the eastern seaboard of the United States and Canada is still connected to the past and it wants to atone for the past. It wants to apologize for it. It wants to debase itself. It wants to include the other in the narrative. And the other who is hostile to the, towards the West is very happy to be involved in that project of attacking the West from within. And that's another aspect of post-colonialism. But when Said comes in, I'm not, I don't think it is anything like that. And uh, his, his text is largely just looking at um, portraying the uh, complexity of what we call the other without the binary that, that drives it. But now the binary does drive it, there's no doubt. And so next time I'm going to talk about Foucault and uh, because he is influential on uh, Said here because Foucault wants to come up with a sort of an archaeology of knowledge and say that what we call man originates in the 19th century. And it's a sexualized man as in heterosexual. And... Uh, We'll talk about, and many people notice this, that the term homosexual originates in the mid-19th century. It does not exist before. It's not a scriptural term. It's not a classical term. It's not even a cultural term at all. Homosexual is just a made-up word of binary differentiation. So there's heterosexual, heteronormativity, and then there's all the other non-heteronormative. You know what I mean by this? Uh, these are Greek. Hetero and homo. Different. Homo is the same. So both of them are Greek. So within that same binary dynamic, it's sort of embarrassing that the, the left, which is in favor of difference, opposes hetero because hetero is different. Right? Because it says that there's a male-female difference and it's... And they oppose heteronormativity. In other words, they oppose difference in the name of difference and promote <laughs> the, the homo, the inclusive, the same in the, in the name of difference. But again, it's the Nietzschean transvaluational value. Um, we're going to ignore the fact that hetero is actually different and it's a difference rooted in nature and in human identity in favor of a, a different form of difference which is actually the same. Now there's the paradox, there's the irony and it will get extended even to the category of, of sex by talking about gender which is a non-thing. Professor, isn't there though um, uh, a Greek, uh, ancient Greek word for homosexual? I yes. Mean, it's, not, it's not normative, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's a word for, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. But just the, the categories that we use in English, yeah. and they will all be in other European languages as well, derive from the Greek, hetero means different and homo means the same. Um, and so a heterosexual and a homosexual, you know, that sexual is just what gets attached to that. Um, is, an, is a 19th century linguistic invention again. Homosexuality is a 19th century linguistic Do we know who coined it? I do and I've forgotten. Can't remember the scholar. 
It's not Foucault, no, no, it's already existing in the 19th century. Yeah. Um, I could look it up. I'm, I might have to bring it up next time because it's part of the narrative. Yes? That's in the intersectionality they start to parse that out about how, yeah. how, how here's the oppressive side, it's the list of these things, and then the, the other side is the oppressed side. Yeah. And then the, the social justice project is to bring the oppressed side into the positions of power because it's connected to, with power, access, authority, etc. These people on the one hand have all of those things and these people, the others, don't have those. How do we rectify it as good Marxists? we give these people power, access, authority, wealth, etc. That's how we do, that's how we rectify injustice. But then what are their ideas of like a lot of this needs to be against homosexuality? Um, <laughs> for example, yeah. Uh, at that point they don't care. And they say you will accept this. Become as oppressors, right, and colonizers, and and in fact, I've even heard uh, people from Africa, Eastern Europe, etc., say exactly that. We don't want to be a colony of your crazy Western notions of human nature. You know, you can stay crazy, but do it in your own place. Don't impose on us. And they say, well, we're not going to give you any aid if you don't accept these. And the World Bank and other financial organizations won't extend you any credit unless you have policies that are inclusive in every sense because we represent inclusion. And their response is this is just neo-colonialism, which seems to me to have at least some legitimacy, especially when it comes down to actually dealing with uh, genuine financial and practical oppression, which is not access to credit, wealth, whatever. Anyway, yes? What happens though when they move the oppressed to the oppressors or like, you know, the power side? <coughs> um, is there a goal? They think everyone's going to be underneath the power side or like, is there a switch that event like will happen where. <coughs> so is it like a pendulum and eventually it swings back and there's yeah, a, is some it sort it of a balance? Yeah, is it going to be like this or do they just hope that everyone's going to just be under power? Like it's some so in the 80s when I went through as an undergrad and I was in classes with people who are being schooled in lit theory. I, I avoided lit theory in, as an undergrad. By doing a double major, I didn't have to do lit theory. Mm -hmm. And then for my sins, I ended up having to teach it. study it and teach it, yeah. <laughs> um, that was, they were promoting very strongly the idea that we ought to be preferentially hiring people that were not white, male, heterosexual, etc. That was back in the 80s already, already and using inclusive language and so forth or not inclusive language, politically correct language. Political, political correctness as a term was being used in the 80s, but they were even extending, well, what do we mean by this to practical spheres, and it was exactly that. And I said, so to my female friends in my English class, but why am I being um, punished for what would have happened before this? I said, I'm, I'm not sexist. I'm in favor of the equality of women, I, I don't, why, why would I? And they said, well, you know, it's basically, if you're gonna make an omelet, you're gonna have to break a few eggs. And I was like, hmm, I'm not sure I'm very happy with that solution. It doesn't seem very just, doesn't seem very equitable and, uh, or particularly fair. Uh, and it seems to me almost the definition of racist or sexist just being flipped around, and that's exactly. And they said, "Yeah, basically." I'm like, "Okay, so at least we know where we stand. You're a sexist, bigot, racist, whatever, and uh, you think that that's rectifying the problem." I can say, "Well, I've never been a Marxist. I'm not. Uh, I don't buy Nietzsche's will to power thing. But you're exhibiting that you're you're totally committed to that." and wanting to advance power and privilege and uh, so forth for your own benefit and to heck with e equity, we know where we stand now, okay. That's the beginning of my fallout with the left. 
is to say there's no justice in this because you can't you're not rectifying the problem of the past by doing unjust things in the present that's just perpetuating injustice in a different way towards a different ad identity group and even one that's on board with you and sympathetic to you how is that right and they just didn't care I thought, okay so there's a lack of integrity there again I know what I'm dealing with here okay and that was in the 80s now it's pushed on into all manner of uh, other areas and if you look in terms of university hiring practices the post-colonial mindset has now really set in it's baked into the system so if you want grad funding you will they will specify what area of study you're going to do you don't make a proposal to uh, for a PhD to a committee saying I want to study this they're saying it will be in this area of studies it will be in post-colonial studies and they might even be specific about what your angle of the research will be it's not going to be your approach it's going to be the one that they want you to study and if you do it and produce the volume of material that they want then there's also a post in the academy that's very specific to post-colonial literature post-colonial studies and they will hire that then and they're not going to hire a, a Shakespeare scholar or a specialist in romantic literature or 16th century literature or 17th century or a medievalist no interest in that they want post-colonial because post-colonial is where humanism goes under the vantage point of the uh, radical left which is what it, it has now evolved in that way and it's now baked into the way they even hire deeply problematic as I said this is an anti-humanist theory I, I said this one I said everything that we're going to study hereafter is an anti-humanist theory insofar as it denies a common human nature if in fact doesn't even think that there is a human nature it says there, it, there's, the, there's the us and then there's the others. Well, you've just dehumanized all the others in a way that you attributed to the West back here. You attributed an anti-humanist motivation for it, which actually Edward Said would have said is ridiculously oversimplifying the situation because the West did not only oppress, even in its worst iterations, like the March for Africa, or the scramble for Africa. Um, there is a lot of taking of goods, but then there is a, um, Christians will often be in the presence of that and there will be beneficial aspects to the advance as well, which at least need to be mentioned, if not emphasized. You can happily disparage the scramble for Africa and present it as complicatedly as Heart of Darkness does. A great post-colonial text you know this text? I do it in first year English. Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which is a very complicated analysis, analysis portrait of Western motivations in relation to the other in Africa, uh, in which there's a blurring of the boundaries between good and evil, white and black, you know, that, that's, that blurred perspective is right there embedded in the narrative. It's very difficult to actually read and figure out what he thinks. All we know is that the, the hero admires a man who's a, a maniac who is willing to kill anyone who gets in his way. The name of Kurtz wants ivory. And he's willing to do it and do anything that he needs to get what he wants and he admires him. So if the hero admires a, a genocidal maniac and he's the one telling the story, well then you don't, you're gonna start questioning perspective, narrative perspective. We have an unreliable narrator telling the story of the heart of darkness. Where's the heart of darkness? Is it in Kurtz, the genocidal maniac? Is it in Marlowe, the man who admires him? Is it in the Western perspective, which can't differentiate between good and evil in its own actions and is only interested in material wealth? I think it's all of the above. But that's within what is called a colonialist text, because the, the, uh, there's a Nigerian novelist by the name of Chinua Achebe who writes a, uh, a book called uh, Things Fall Apart, after a line from Yeats' poem. Um, who, who cites this text and he, he is unhappy, 
now not from an Orientalist perspective, but from an African perspective of how the Africans are portrayed in Marlowe's novella. So he says the Africans are portrayed as lazy, stupid, ignorant, you know, they're just brutes. And I would say he's correct, they are, but he's missing the point. That, that they are being portrayed that way because um, Conrad is portraying to some degree uh, the, the fall of the West and its intellect and its dehumanization of people that results from that. And he's going to root it in, or, or I root it in my lecture, I'm just lecturing on it in my first year class right now, in Darwinist theories about human nature. So I talked at the beginning about you know, the Indians in North America, why are they called Indians, where did they come, which one of the three sons of uh, Noah did they come from, etc. In, in this period there's a, not only a return to that question of who are these original people, but also a sense that there's a hierarchy of uh, excellence amongst them. And one of them is the, the fittest, which should survive, and the lesser form should not survive. And the ones that are the fittest are the white. That's the backdrop for Marla or Conrad's Heart of Darkness, is the advance of white European rational civilization. And the other than the Orient is actually presented as a less advanced, less worthy, less fit to survive world. So I would like to take Conrad's or Said's Orientalism and and, and look at it a little bit more carefully and, dis and question whether the real problem is the, the West versus the East or whether the problem is looking at humanity through the vantage point of social Darwinism and everything that comes with that. Because that's what I think the real problem is, social Darwinism, which disputes the idea that the human person is actually different from an animal. It's a more evolved version, but it deserves to survive. And you know, nature is what it is. Nature is pitiless. It doesn't. There's no, mor morality is not the is not the consideration. Survival is the consideration. And if survival is the consideration, then we have to be more efficient. And that's the that's the note of Heart of Darkness. The commitment to efficiency is what difference differentiates us from the Romans, who also went into Britain and colonized it, as he says. This was also once one of the dark areas of the world. That's a direct quote from the, from the novella when they're on the River, T River T Thames right at the outset. This also is one of the dark places. And so now we who are going into Africa, which is dark Africa, and in, in uh, 1899, I think, when the novella is published, I think the Congo, uh, which is yellow Belgian at this point, was still a white space on the map because the because the jungle was almost impossible to explore, but still it was under the auspices of the king of Belgium, um, was terra incognita. It's a place where the West needed to colonize in order to make it civilized. But they were still committed to the, uh, an ideal of efficiency, which wasn't meant to kill the Africans. It was meant to make the colonizing people survive because they were afraid of extermination. So they're under the thrall of an idea which Darwinism itself brings about. This is why I'm anti-Darwinist, down to the ground. I think it's a terrible non-scientific idea, but I also think its social consequences are so iniquitous that we still labor under them in the academy. So, that, that, so the post-colonial studies is committed to the extermination of the West. There's my finale. It's committed to the extermination of the West, to atone for the crimes done in the past, the crimes, some of which are crimes. But, but the whole idea of expanding, colonizing, exercising dominion is presented as, a, as an iniquitous power grab motivated by the desire to kill, rape, pillage, etc. That's a Darwinist explanation. All right, it's just survival. If you're gonna survive, are you gonna care whether you eat meat or vegetables? You're gonna eat anything. 
in front of you to survive. Ethical considerations, whatever. Are you going to are you going to cannibalize? Yes, you will do that as well. So we'll remove all of that. It's all about survival. The survival motivation drives the post-colonialist uh, enterprise. I think I've gone over my time, so I am.